Well, welcome to our next session where we're going to continue discussing issues that relate to the mission field. This subject particularly relates specifically to leadership issues and conflict management. But let's again just open in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we again seek your guidance by your Spirit, Lord, especially those who will have leadership roles and will have to learn to manage conflict out there in the mission field. Father, it's, it's never easy to manage conflict, but Father, we pray that you give us wisdom, uh, give all your people wisdom that we may glorify you and have the unity of the Spirit that you desire for us all. In Jesus' name, amen. So leadership issues and conflict management. This talk is going to be targeted mainly at those of you who will have leadership roles. Although there will be messages here, there will be things that people can learn who are under leadership. This is primarily targeted at those of you who are leaders. So let's just have a look at our next slide. On the screen, I've put up here that church leadership is a dictatorship. Some of you at this stage may balk at such a statement. And of course, I've made it deliberately provocative. But the fact remains, as you look through church history, as you look through particularly biblical history, under God's chosen leadership structure, it was always effectively a dictatorship. There was never democracy. Now on our next slide, we see this view throughout biblical history that God's leaders have been appointed by God, appointed by his Holy Spirit. Never, and let me stress this, never voted in democratically. To me, it's a, a sad failure of Christendom and of, in fact, most churches out there that they vote in their leaders. Their leaders get voted in uh, by people being able to decide whether they like the person, whether they think they're the ones worthy to be leading them, rather than God doing the appointing. Now, on our next slide, we've got a scripture here from 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 6. And most of you, or some of you, probably will be aware of this account. It relates to David's life. And David said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put forth my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. Now, this scripture relates specifically to the account in David's life where Saul had been chosen by God to lead the nation of Israel, to be the king of Israel. Saul effectively had disqualified himself by disobeying God's command. And in turn, God had then sent the prophet Samuel to anoint David to replace him. And David had the opportunity a couple of times, once in a cave when Saul went in there, Another time when he and his men snuck into Saul's camp, he had the opportunity to slay Saul and to replace him as king. And his men tempted him to do this. David's attitude, though, was that Saul, no matter what he'd done, how bad his kingship was, until God removed him, he was the Lord's anointed. And he refused to lift his hand against the Lord's anointed. Going on in that story in 1 Samuel chapter 24, 10, in our next slide. Behold this day, thine eyes have seen how the Lord has delivered you today in my hand in the cave. This is David speaking to Saul. Some bid me kill you, but my eye spared you. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Again, the next scripture on the slide, on the screen. In 1 Samuel 26, verse 9, David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And our next slide again from 1 Samuel 26, verse 11, The Lord forbid that I should put forth my hand against the Lord's anointed, but now take, I pray you, the spear that is at his head, the cruise of water, and let us go. And of course, this relates to the time when David and his, his men um, snuck in to the camp and were able to kill Saul if they wanted to. In Acts 5, we see the same principle. When on the screen here as it is, Acts 5, verses 1 to 4, 
Ananias and Sapphira had lied to the apostles about how much money they had sold a certain piece of land for that they were going to donate to the church. And in verse 4, Peter says to them, How is it that you have conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Effectively, in lying to Peter and the apostles, Ananias and Sapphira had lied to God. Why? Because Peter and the apostles were God's chosen representatives. David would not lift his hand against the Lord's anointed. On our next slide, in James 3, verse 1, it says there, My brothers, don't be quick to want to be teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, those of you who are here at the missionary training program, you're here because in some way, God and, and we um, who have chosen you to come, as it were, or invited you to come, we can see in you leadership qualities. And that's a wonderful thing to have. But I need you to be aware if you are going to be a leader, especially for the Lord, preaching to people, teaching people his word, you take upon yourself a great responsibility. Be aware of that. Now also, just coming back to the story of David and Saul, it really sets a wonderful precedent for us on our attitude to our leaders. You know, it's common, again, in, in a lot of churches that when the people get tired of a particular pastor or minister, they give them the boot or they vote them out. Is that God doing that? Well, no. De democracy, let me stress again, is never, ever the model in Scripture. I, I frankly don't see how or from where churches get such a leadership structure. And it's, it's no surprise to me that so many churches really are defunct in true spirituality as a result of this. God appoints leaders, and God forbid that we or anybody else should seek to unappoint them. That is God's prerogative. On our next slide, I've got a quote there for you from Daniel 4, verse 17. This is a wonderful scripture, again, putting things really where it is at. The matter is by the decree of the watchers. And I'm just going to skip to the end of that. That the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men. It is he who sets up over them whomsoever he will, even the basest of men. It is God who rules in the kingdoms of men, let alone the kingdom or the structure of the church, the, the body of Christ. And he sets up even sometimes base fellows, base people, in other words, people we would think not the right people for the job. He has his purposes. Our next slide is a quote from 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. It says there, You are the body of Christ and members in part. So although a leader certainly has a different role, we are all still part of the body of Christ. So you as a leader need to appreciate, yes, you have more responsibility to the Lord for leading the flock, for pastoring the flock, for shepherding the flock. But we are also all part of the same body. You see, who is the head? Who is the head of the church? Who is the head of the body? Is it not Jesus Christ himself? We are all servants of his. Now, in our next slide, you'll see this subtitle, Decision Making. And as a leader, inevitably, you are going to be called upon to make decisions over those of whom you have the oversight. Now, next slide is a quote here from Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. It says, Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, of course, it's a wonderful scripture. It applies to all Christians, in fact. But particularly those of you who will be leaders. As soon as you're a leader in, in anything, you can be the captain of the rugby team. You can be the president of the bridge club. 
the pastor of a church. As soon as you are in a leadership position, I'm sorry, but you're a target. I know this from personal experience. Those of you who have had leadership roles also know. You become a target. As soon as you stick your head up as a leader, it's like there's a big bullseye painted on your forehead. And unfortunately, there are always going to be a certain type of people, even in the church, called by God, who will want to fire at that target. Don't be discouraged by that. If you are appointed by God, he will look after you. Don't be anxious. Pray for his help. I want to share with you a couple of testimonies about the leadership structure in our church. We're blessed uh, to have a wonderful pastor, a wonderful shepherd, um, who the Lord used to set up the church that I'm a member of, and he's been the pastor there. Now, since its inception in 1978, that's now 34 years. In the early years of the church, when people were coming in at, at quite a rate, and at that point, many didn't officially recognize him as pastor. On two separate occasions, men got up at the front of the church, and their plan was, as was found out later, to undermine the pastor's leadership, to say things that would challenge his authority. On one particular time, this gentleman went down the front of the church ready to basically lambast the leadership and get support from everybody. He went down to do this. He said nothing in the end because he broke down in tears and went and sat back down in his seat. God clearly was not going to allow this man to undermine the leadership God had chosen. On another occasion, another gentleman was out to do the same thing. He went down to the front of the church again with, with this agenda. This, this gentleman had false teeth. And as he went to speak, his false teeth shot out and got stuck in his mouth, effectively stopping him in his tracks. Now, I don't know about you, but that's God at work. That's God closing the mouths of those seeking to undermine his anointed. So if you're in a position of leadership, it's not about having to gather allies all the time, having to put yourself forward. Please, please, don't, don't target me. Don't, don't be mean towards me. You do the right thing by the Lord, and he will back you. Now again, on our next slide here, in relation to David again, he constantly prayed to the Lord. Through the book of Samuel, you'll read how David inquired of the Lord. Do the same thing. And of course, Jesus is the ultimate example. There's no better leader. But sadly, when you read the account through the Gospels, there was probably no other man in history most targeted and yet most perfect in his dealings with people. In Luke 6 verse 12, it says, It happened in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray. This is Jesus. And he was spending the night in prayer to God. Jesus knew the power and the solace that he got from praying to his Father in heaven. Our next scripture from Proverbs 11 verse 14. We're no counselors, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. As a leader, do your best through God's leading and your own wisdom to surround yourself with counselors. As a leader, you're not going to know it all. You're not going to have all the abilities and gifts required to lead the church. Again, remind you when we talked about the listing of, of gifts in the New Testament. Some were apostles, some were teachers, some were prophets, etc. Some were pastors. And perhaps you're a pastor, very good at shepherding people. Doesn't necessarily mean you're the best teacher in your church or, or in your fellowship. So surround yourself with wise counselors who can help you in your counsel. On the screen now, we have this scripture from Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. The things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit to faithful men. It applies to women as well, of course, but in a, a different leadership role. We'll come to that. Who shall be able to teach others also. 
So your role as a teacher is to try and find faithful men, again, with the leading of the Lord, teach them so that they can teach others also. You know, leadership fails where it is, I am the kingpin, I'm not going to share with anybody else, sorry, leadership dies with you. It's not true spiritual leadership. True spiritual leadership wants to share, help build others around you. Our next slide here has the scripture from 1 Timothy 3, verse 1. Faithful is the saying, if a man seeks the office of a bishop, now we might hear that word and get hung up on sort of Christendom's tradition with their bishops and their popes and whatever. The word bishop just means a superintendent. That's all it is. And you'll find in scripture, bishop, elder, superintendent, pastor, shepherd, all effectively synonymous terms. They describe one who is leading the flock or superintending the flock. So if you desire to be a superintendent, you desire a good work. But the superintendent must be without reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, orderly, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not a brawler, not a striker, gentle, not contentious, not a lover of money, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. But if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, that is a beginner, or, or we might say a new convert, lest being puffed up, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have good testimony from them who are without the church, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Wow, what a list. But there it is in Scripture. These are the qualifications for someone who's going to be a leader. There's quite a list there. And again, it doesn't matter if you get the most votes. It's whether you qualify under this list. God is clearly wanting his leaders to have a high degree of spiritual integrity and to be a people who, by example, show this. For example, leaders of their own house disciplining their children well, someone who has a, a good report, perhaps in their workplace or, or from those without. Now bear in mind, these are not my words, these are the words of Scripture. Again, in Titus, the next uh, one on the, the screen, Titus 1, he says uh, again and from verse 6, If any man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having children that believe, who are not accused of riot or unruly, for the bishop or the superintendent must be blameless as God's steward, not self-willed, not soon angry, not a brawler or a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but given to hospitality, a lover of good, sober-minded, just, holy, temperate, holding to the faithful word which is according to the teaching that he may be able to both exhort in the sound doctrine and to convict the gainsayers. So again, a good leader will know his Bible. He will be able to defend the faith, be hospitable. That's, that's another thing thrown in there. Not interested in money, blameless, not self-willed. So again, there is a, there's a high degree of integrity required. And perhaps that's another problem with a lot of the churches today. People can go to theological school, pass the test, do the theory, come out and get a job, get a, an occupation, being a church minister. On the screen, I've given you the definitions of a bishop. As I said, it's a superintendent. The Bible talks about elders in the same light. It, it already is synonymous. An elder literally means an older person or a senior, but it also applies to someone who is a leader spiritually. And really, it's talking about someone who has the wisdom of years. And you can be a young person and have that. Timothy was one example in the scriptures. Uh, next slide on the screen from Acts chapter 14 verse 23 says, When they had appointed for them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. Now this is an example 
of how the apostles would go forth preaching the gospel uh, through the world. They would get converts, sometimes staying in a particular place for quite a long period of time, other times a short period of time. But when it was time to move on, they would appoint elders. In other words, leaders, sometimes singular, sometimes plural. If it was a small group, then obviously one elder may be enough. Other times, elders to share the load. And they would appoint them to be leaders. Notice again, appointed, not voted, appointed by the apostles who were filled with the Spirit. The next one on the screen from 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders that rule be counted worthy of double honour, especially those who labour in the word and in teaching. Now, although from God's point of view, a leader who rules well, he's worthy of double honour, don't be quick to claim this. You know, a leader can say, ah, I've been working so hard for the church. You should be honouring me. You should be giving me. Double honour of everybody else. Well, that's really not the sign of humility, is it? Which is a big part of being a true leader. On the next slide from Mark, chapter 10, reading from verse 42. Jesus called them to him and said, You know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, they exercise lordship, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. Whoever will be the chief shall be the servant of all. For even the Son of Man came to not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So here's Jesus' example. In fact, he lived it himself. The Son of God, our Lord, our Master, as we discussed today, um, in, in Heidi's little talk there, washed the disciples' feet. He led by example. So clearly spiritual leadership is different in this regard from worldly leadership. You look at the presidents of this world, the prime ministers or whatever, they have the flashiest cars, they have the, the, the bodyguards around them, they have the best suits, etc. Not so... In Christianity, true leaders are those who will actually be servants to their flock, like Christ, seeking the lost sheep and putting themselves out. On the next slide here, I've given you the definition of a pastor. A pastor is just a shepherd, someone who looks after sheep, which of course relates symbolically to the flock of the Lord, Christians. In Ephesians 4, it says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So whatever our role is in the body of Christ, this is the aim that we are working together as one to edify and unify each other. On the next slide, we have a quote here from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. So here Jesus is referred to as shepherd, pastor, bishop, Superintendent, you see, the, all these terms are effectively synonymous. Obviously with slightly different lessons we can learn, but as far as leadership goes, basically synonymous. Right, the next slide here I've subtitled Conflict Management. Whoa, now we're getting into it. As a leader, you're going to have to deal with conflict. How do you do that? Well, on the next slide... I've given you a quote from 1 Timothy 5, verse 1. Do not sharply rebuke an elder, but exhort as a father, and the younger ones as brothers. Now, I guess this would apply to those who are wanting to speak to their elder or have a problem with their leader. They're being exhorted 
Don't go and rebuke him, but, but entreat him or exhort him as a father. And your younger brethren, speak to them as, as brothers. You pick up in the scripture very much a spirit of humility and one of respect, not only towards your leader or your elder, but towards others around you. Now, it's not wrong to have a disagreement with your leader. You know, we mustn't think you as a leader or those who are over you are somehow demigods. Of course, that's, that's the other extreme. That can happen as well. They're not. They're like you and me. And we, if, we, if we're leaders, we're like, we're like our brethren. However, we have a role to lead. And if you look at leadership in the Bible, you're required to lead, to be a shepherd, to lead a sheep. Because you'll find most people in life, no matter what culture you come from, need to be led. And a lot of people actually don't like to be the leader. But if you have a, a difference of opinion with your pastor or, or whatever, go to him. Talk it out in humility. I have. I've had things that I've disagreed on with, with my pastor. But we've been able as men to sit down and, and thrash it out, discuss the issue, and come away actually loving each other more. How is that possible? Well, it's possible where the spirit of Christ is. Because, you know, my pastor said to me once, John, I appreciate the fact that you've disagreed with me because the last thing I want around me are yes men. And as a leader, that should be our attitude. We don't want people around us who are yes men who are just going to do what we say blindly, never question or, or wonder. When we preach from the platform, you know, the difference between us and most of Christendom is we will preach and say, go away and check it out yourself. It is important you know the scriptures. You know, throughout the dark ages and even today, most church leaders stand up and say, here's what I'm teaching you, listen to me, do as I say, don't go and check it out yourself. It's power play. It's a way of hanging on to power. Keep the masses ignorant. It was used for extortion all through the Middle Ages and even is today, I'm, I'm sad to say, in many churches. Now, next slide, we've got this quote from Matthew 18, verse 7. Woe to the world because of offences, for it is necessary that offences come, but woe to that man by whom the offence comes. This gives us an insight into the way things are going to have to be. You are going to have offences. Don't deny it. Prepare for it. It is inevitable. Offences are going to come. Just don't be the one who brings the offence. Our next slide from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 18 to 19 First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it, Paul says. And in verse 19, 4, there must also be, it's heresies in my Bible, it's not a great translation, it should be divisions. It's not talking about doctrinal misunderstandings, it's talking about divisions. For there must also be divisions among you, that the approved ones may be revealed among you. So sometimes there will be differences, there will be divisions, and it will reveal to you as a leader, effectively, who is on the Lord's side. You know, it's not until people are prepared to stick their head above the parapet that you know really where they are at. Next scripture on the screen is from Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. We've talked about this before. I need to go back to that again. But it's in relation to dealing with conflict. If your brother has trespassed against you. As a leader or a pastor, you'll get members of your church will come to you and say, Brother so-and-so has said this about me. Or sister so-and-so has done this to me. Very tempting to say, oh really? That's terrible. Come on, let, let's go and sort it out. Refer them to Matthew 18. And say, hang on a minute, brother. They haven't done that against me. They've done that against you, right? Matthew 18. If it's a trespass against you, you go. You go. 
and sort it out with your brother or sister. Now, of course, it goes on to say if they won't listen, take two more, etc. You can read that for yourself. But initially, we need to encourage people, sort it out amongst yourself. Most offences don't need to get broadcast to one and all. They can and should be sorted out one to one. Now, next scripture on the screen, we're again in Matthew 18. And again, we've talked about this, but it's where Peter asks, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. And he goes on to give the parable of the man, uh, the, the, the kingdom. It's like a king reckoning with his servants as an example of that. Forgiveness. We've majored on this theme in our first week of our program, but it is so important. You as a leader need to have it, but you need to inculcate it in your people as well that you are leading. Matthew 7, we've talked about this also. Next uh, scripture on the screen. It says, Judge not that you may not be judged. I have no problem with that. We shouldn't condemn people, which is what the sense of this scripture is about. And again, in Romans 14, on the screen there, we know that we are all just fellow servants. One man regards a day above another. One man wants to eat vegetables and another meat. They're not issues that should separate us. And we've, we've talked about that. We're not to judge one another. Um, so Romans 14, 9 to 13 there. We're going to go to the next scripture, which is 1 Corinthians 6. Verse 1, because in the subject of judging, yes, we're not to judge each other as far as condemning them, and that is the context of that. But how are we to understand 1 Corinthians 6 when it says, Do any of you dare, when you have a matter against another, to go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? In verse 2, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now, this is one of those sad facts about our English translation. Different words have been translated judge. Now, in Matthew 7, when we're told not to judge, it's, of course, relating to condemning each other. That is wrong. But as a church leader, you're going to be required to judge things, to judge the matters that people bring to you as Solomon did, you remember. You need to be aware of this principle in Scripture. I'll give you another example where Jesus said, um, straight is the gate that leads to eternal life. He says, strive to enter in. Okay, so we're, we're to strive. And then you'll read later on in Timothy, it will say, don't, don't strive. Same English word. It's quite confusing. Different Greek words. When Jesus said strive to enter in, it's agonosomai. In other words, he's saying agonize, make an effort to enter in. But when he says don't strive, he's saying don't have, don't have troubles with each other. So that's a good thing about Bible study. You, you discover these things. So coming back to judging then, as a leader, you're going to be required to make judgments. Don't think that's wrong on the basis of 1 Corinthians 6. You, you know, you're going to be required to do that. And pray for wisdom to do that. Again, as I've already discussed, leading people to try and sort things out amongst themselves, ideally, first of all. 1 Corinthians 5, we've talked about that already. This was an incident where people had to be, or, or a person, had to be put out of the church on the basis of fornication. You know, you have to make some tough calls sometimes as leaders, but it is a last resort. Our role, like Jesus, is to try and sucker people as much as possible and, and bear them. Our next slide is written that jealousy is often an issue for leaders. So true. I mentioned to you earlier that if you're a leader, you're a target. Sorry, that's the way it's going to be. If that's not for you, then perhaps don't desire, as we've read, and Timothy, the, the position of a superintendent. But I tell you, even if you don't desire it, 
God may still give it to you. I've had that experience. Uh, the last thing I wanted was a leadership role, but it sort of came my way. You've got to run with what God wants you to do in your life. So jealousy is an issue. You know, Jesus was crucified because of jealousy or envy. Same thing. Pilate knew that. Matthew 27, verse 18, he knew, that is, Pilate knew, that for envy they had delivered him. Now, how bad was Jesus' leadership? Was he a terrible leader, a terrible shepherd? No, of course not. You couldn't have got a better, more faithful, more compassionate leader, could you? And yet people were still envious. They were jealous of him. And it's a sad commentary on human nature, but it is the truth. So each one of us who are certainly lesser, lesser in that regard than Jesus, expect the same thing. If you're a leader... Somewhere along the way, you're probably going to experience someone is going to be jealous of you, envious of you. Remember, we talked about David before. He experienced this with Saul, and that's why he had so many problems with Saul chasing him here and there. But if you're the Lord's anointed, and that's the key, you haven't been voted in by your friends or whatever. You haven't got the placards and said, vote for me, vote for me. If you've got your position because God has put you there, don't worry about it. He will take care of you. In the next slide, we've got a quote here from Proverbs. Proverbs 14, verse 30. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. The next slide is a quote from Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, for love is strong as death, but jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire which have a most vehement flame. Jealousy. It's a terribly strong and destructive emotion. And those who are jealous of you will often do a lot of harm. But I'd encourage you, don't be tempted to fight fire with fire. Do what Jesus did. And he will make sure if you're to be elevated, you'll be elevated. Next slide. Quotes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So if you experience this as a leader, you're in good company. Jesus, all the prophets, they experience the same thing. There will always be this issue, sadly. So don't feel like, well, you know, I'm the only one who's, who's ever experienced this as a leader. The next slide from Matthew 5, 44. Again, Jesus says this, these most challenging words. I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you, so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son, listen to this, he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends his reign on the just and the unjust. Now if you love those who love you, what reward do you have, he says. Do not even tax collectors do that? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you have more than others? Therefore, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. If we want to be the Son of God, we've got to follow his example. Now, these aren't easy. I've got to say, whenever I read this portion, what we call the Beatitudes, each year or twice a year in, in my daily readings, every time I think, wow, Lord, wow, that, that's a big ask. But he says there, the challenge is laid down for us. Be perfect. Love your enemies. But what a reward there is if you exercise that through the Spirit of the Lord. The next slide is from Matthew 13. Servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in the field? 
Why has it got tears or weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the servant said to him, Will we go and gather them up? But the landowner said, No, lest while you gather up the weeds or the tears, you root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather first the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now this little parable raises a very interesting example that I think we can learn from. You're a leader over a church, say, and you've got some people that are nothing but problems. Well, you're praying for them, you're trying to be nice to them, etc. They're nothing but problems. You know, you feel like they should go. But I think this example is teaching us, listen, wait until the harvest. Because what can often happen, and we've had this example also in our fellowship, if you pull somebody out, it can have an on-flow effect. You know, their family members maybe get their nose out, so they go as well, and their best friend thinks you treated them unfairly, so they go as well. It can, it can end up, like this parable says, pulling out a lot of the good wheat as well. Have patience. Remember David. He had to have patience for the Lord to act. And finally, of course, he did. By divine judgment, Saul was slain in battle by the Lord. Coming to Revelation, our next scripture on the screen. Um, throughout these letters to the churches, the same principle applies. John writes, or Jesus writes through John, for them to strengthen strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die you know you may sometimes feel in your leadership capacity i just i just feel like we're going downhill things are, are dying things are going backwards well be watchful and strengthen the things that remain it's it's very tempting to jump to want to jump ship but sometimes you know you can jump from the frying pan into the fire, as, as the saying goes. This scripture encourages the leaders, as they are written to, the leaders of these seven churches, to strengthen, to do their best to put things right in the church. The next subheading we have on the screen here is gender. Gender in church leadership. So I just want us to think now about this from a, a biblical perspective. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 says, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Very simply, this lays out the divine hierarchy. God is above Christ. Christ isn't equal, of course, to God. Christ is the head of the church or the head of man, and man is the head of woman. 1 Timothy 2 11, and Bear in mind, these aren't my words. These are the words of Scripture. It says, let a man, uh, sorry, let a woman, rather, let a woman learn in quietness with all subjection. I permit not a woman to teach so much as to have dominion over a man, but to be in quietness. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not beguiled, but the woman being beguiled had fallen into transgression. Now, of course, it's very common in most churches today, that uh, pastors, ministers, even bishops in some of the bigger mainline churches nowadays are women. Um, I don't believe, personally, it's my understanding of Scripture, that women should have uh, pastoring roles in a church, unless, of course, um, there are only women, because as I'll point out in a moment, women can teach. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but in verse uh, 12 of 1 Timothy 2, I read it this way, I permit not a woman to teach so much as to have dominion over a man. If you check the Greek word that's usually translated or, it's often translated so much as, and I think gives the true sense of the scripture, because clearly elsewhere in scripture, women are told to teach the younger women, and of course um, their, their children. So there is a teaching role for women in the church, particularly around the children and other women, but not so much as 
it has dominion over a man or usurps authority over a man. Now, at this weekend, for example, we've had Sister Cindy teaching us about medical things in relation to the mission field. Um, I have no problem with that because she's not standing up there all bullshit like some of these women are, wanting to be equal with a man and wanting to be the teacher. She's been asked under the headship of, of her husband, um, Duncan, to do so. And Cindy, as, as we all know, those of you who know Cindy, is a very humble person. That's, that's not her nature. So this is the way I see scripture. Um, I was interested to hear Cindy actually when she was talking uh, about this. She said, you know, a lot of women want to be teachers. Spent a lot of energy, oh, I want to be equal, I want to be equal, I should be equal. When frankly, all their energy could be targeted in other areas to help people. So that was Cindy's own comment on that. Clearly women, however, can pray and can prophesy. Because in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 5, we read every woman praying or prophesying, praying or prophesying. This was happening um, in, in the church. Now, I distinguish prophesying from teaching. Um, if you read Romans there, the, the different abilities, pastoring, teachers, prophes, uh, prophets, they are a different ministry. Speaking forth the word of God or predicting the future, doing a, a reading, for example, is how I would put that. But not teaching so much as they are usurping authority over a man. Titus, just want to quote this to you, our next slide, Titus 2 verse 3, The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as become holiness, not false accusers, diabolos by the way, devils, not false accusers, or given to much wine, teachers of good things. So here's a reference to women teaching. That, in context, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So it's quite an important principle we're talking about, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, you may have a different perspective on that. Um, that's fine. Just make sure you've got chapter and verse to back it up. Just want to talk now in relation to leadership about paid ministry. Should. Should we be paid? Again, it's very common in Christendom, pastors, ministers, church secretaries, elders, etc., etc., often receive big salaries as a job. And in this slide here, I've got a quote from Luke chapter 10. This is where Jesus sends out the disciples two by two. He tells them to go with neither purse, nor bag, nor sandals, and to go into houses, preach the gospel if they're received, to let their peace rest upon them, and if not, to shake their, their feet, the dust off their feet and, and carry on. He says in verse 7, Remain in the same house, that is assuming you're accepted, eating and drinking the things shared by them, for the labourer is worthy of his hire. Now, of course, this is often quoted in church circles. Well, I'm a pastor, I'm working full-time for the church, I'm worthy of my hire. Which usually includes a good salary, a car, a house, holiday pay, etc., etc. Now, I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to here. He was saying to his disciples, eat and drink what's put in front of you. That was their hire. He wasn't saying, well, make sure you get your money paid to you. Now, you'll all be aware, as soon as money is injected into anything, corruption tends to ensue. You take sport, amateur sport, People have fun playing sport. It becomes professional. All of a sudden, you can gamble on it. There's games thrown for money. There's corruption, etc., etc. It is no different in the church. Where this whole thing of paid ministry has been introduced, you now have pastors who can't really preach directly like they should because they're afraid they'll, they'll lose people in their church. Or the rich guy who pays his salary... If he offends him, well, he, he won't be able to pay his salary anymore. I actually maintain, if all paid ministers stopped being paid today, how many of them would stay in the ministry? Is it a calling or is it just a job 
to them. Now, next slide from 1 Corinthians 16, uh, and Josh referred to this earlier today. It says, Concerning the collection for the saints, upon the first day of the week, let each one of you lay up in store as he may prosper, that no collections be made when I come. Now, this obviously shows that in the New Testament church, they made collections, they took up an offering to support the work of the church. But it doesn't mean it was used to pay a fat salary to somebody. Also, the next slide, Acts 20, first day of the week, they would break bread. So it seemed that the, the offering coincided with them meeting to break bread. And the next slide on 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, said, Each one, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not of grief or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. I just want to talk a little bit about tithing. Um, under the Old Testament, tithes were paid to support the Levitical priesthood because basically they worked as priests. So they needed to be supported. So a tithe of the increase of the crop was brought forward and it was used to support the Levites. Now there's a big thing about tithing in most churches today. But the problem is the Levitical priesthood is no more. All believers are kings and priests. So there is not this necessity for us to be supporting a particular priesthood. Yes, we're asked to give what we want to give, and God loves a cheerful giver, but it seems to me in many churches, and I've, I've, I've been to meetings, I've watched programs, how this goes, there's a huge emphasis. Sometimes 80 or 90% of the messages a church pastor will give will end up revolving around tithing. You know, it's tithe because this is biblical, and if you don't, you're disobeying God, and you will get so blessed if you give, God will give you back. We call it the prosperity gospel. And frankly, it's just another way of extorting money for the glory of people taking big fat salaries a lot of the time. Now, if you want to tithe, you're free to do so. But let's have a look at how the Apostle Paul did things, by example. On the screen, we've got a quote from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So affectionately longing for you, we were willing to have imparted to you not only the gospel, but also our own souls, because you have become beloved to us. For brothers, you remember our labor and toil, for laboring night and day in order not to be a burden on any of you. We preach the gospel of God to you. The Apostle Paul, he regarded it as important that he didn't have to rely on the people's offering. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for a missionary to be supported in his missionary work, but that's a lot different from a big salary and holiday pay and, and all that. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, the next scripture on, this, on the screen, he says, The children ought not to lay up treasure for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will gladly spend and be spent for your souls even if loving you more and more, I am loved the less. Wonderful example of Paul. He was a tent maker, and he used his occupational skill to basically pay his own way. Again, in our fellowship, we have no paid ministry. Nobody gets paid a cent. But people do the ministry because they want to. The pastor pastors, those who give the word, prepare the talks each week, those who play the music, play the music, the lady who brings the flowers pays for the flowers, etc., etc. And you have a functioning body contributing to the work of the Lord out of love, not just for the money. The next slide, 2 Thessalonians 3. Neither did we eat any man's bread, but we worked with labor and travail night and day, so that we might not be heavy on you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example to you to imitate us. So if you find yourself in church leadership, remember those words. In Acts chapter 18, the next one on the screen, he talks here about being tent makers. Um, we'll just quickly flick through these. 
The next slide, 1 Corinthians 4, we labor working with our own hands. 1 Corinthians 9, again, um, actually just slightly different theme. He says, who serves as a soldier at his own wages or at any time? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Who feeds a flock and does not partake of the milk of the flock? What he's saying here is that if you're out on the mission field, it is reasonable, just like a soldier going out to battle, that you are supported. He goes on to say in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 10, does he say it all together for our sake? It's written for us that he who plows should plow in hope, so that he who threshes in hope should be made partaker of the hope. If we have sown to you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So he's actually saying if we're out preaching the gospel, it's not wrong that our brothers and sisters at home or whatever are providing some funds to maybe be able to help us um, eat while, while we're away. But again, this is a lot different than a salary which, which has made it our occupation. I'm going to flick... Uh, Past 1 Corinthians 9, the next one. 1 Corinthians 9 again, same theme. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 9 is the slide that's up there. Being present with you, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers from Macedonia made up completely my need. And in every way I've kept myself from being burdensome to you, and I will keep myself. So here was an example where brothers from another centre was supporting Paul so that he could do the mission work, so that going to a poorer place, he didn't have to uh, need anything from them. 1 Peter 2.9, the next slide uh, up there, talks about us all being a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Again, no longer do we have this Levitical system. It says, let your conduct, on the next slide, Philippians 1.27, let your conduct be as becomes the gospel of Christ, so that whether I am uh, with you or absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, striving together with one mind for the faith of the gospel. And really, you can't get much better exhortation to those of you who may be leaders in that capacity. Stand fast, he is saying there. Philippians 2, the next slide. If there is any... Uh, if there is therefore any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any tendency or tenderness and mercies rather, fulfill my joy that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Again, the stressing of this unity. First Peter 3 verse 8, our next slide. Finally, all be of one mind, having compassion on one another, loving the brothers, tender-hearted, friendly. And again, these are exhortations to all believers, but particularly you as a leader, have compassion on one another. Love the brothers. You know, a leader, as we've discussed, is a shepherd. He must care about the sheep, care for the lost sheep, must be tender-hearted, friendly, I've discussed before on our next slide that truth is a package deal. It's not just having all your doctrines and theory right, but it includes moral and attitudinal purity. And most times in Scripture when you read about truth, it relates to morals and attitudes more than all the knowledge that we have. Now that concludes this session. So in just summing up, I'd just like to say for those of you who will find yourself by the anointing or appointing of the Lord as leaders. It can be a very daunting position, particularly if you don't have, as, as I've mentioned, perhaps many around you to support you. Well, let me say this, you have us, and although we're not the Lord, we are fellow brothers who can help you um, in the work that you're doing. And if the Lord has chosen you, as he did with David, he will empower you, he will protect you. Again, the example of David is a wonderful precedent because he had to encounter, although he was a Lord's anointed, he had to encounter much opposition from Saul, chased literally around the mountains, through, through the caves, etc. 
And of course, Jesus ultimately experienced that. He knows, he knows what it's like to be a good leader and yet to be maligned. So let me encourage you to be the best leader you can, to follow these principles, not lording it over people, but being a servant. And when the flack comes your way, I guarantee you it will cause you to press in deeper and deeper to the Lord. Your faith will grow. Your trust in the Lord will grow and he will develop you. Um, so I just pray all of us who find ourselves in this position will be faithful to the Lord and worthy of that double honor. Amen.